I read the words of pastor and author Brian Wilkerson, who writes, Years ago, when our kids were young, we were out at a themed restaurant, which had TVs all over the walls, playing cartoons with no sound. Our youngest son, who was about four at the time, had his eyes glued to the TV screen. He was watching a continuous loop of Roadrunner cartoons, watching as Wiley Coyote strapped on rocket-propelled skates or shot himself out of a cannon or launched himself from a giant slingshot in pursuit of the elusive Roadrunner. After watching intently for a long time, he had an epiphany. Without taking his eyes off the screen, he quietly announced to our family, no matter what he does, he's never going to get the chicken. <laughs> Isn't that the human storyline, asks Wilkerson. No matter what we do, we're never going to beat sin and death. No matter how many self-help books we read, no matter how many promises we make to ourselves and others, sin continues to wreak havoc on our careers, our relationships, and our good times. No matter how many peace treaties are signed, no matter how many relief efforts are launched, we still can't fix what's wrong with the world. And no matter how many vitamins we take, no matter how much we exercise and eat right, no matter how many advances we make in medicine, we just can't beat death. No matter what he does, he's never going to get the chicken. Every human being since Adam and Eve has lived his or her own version of that same story. So what's your version of that story this morning? What chicken have you been chasing? We all do it. We do it in ways legitimate and illegitimate, healthy and unhealthy. We chase a better lifestyle, a more sleek, svelte, healthy body. We chase the elusive pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We try to stave off the effects of aging, chasing the dream of youth. We chase after an ever-elusive love relationship. Maybe your pursuit is a job, a new home, a letter from a medical school that begins, congratulations. We're all chasing something. But for many of us, we have finally reached the conclusion that we are like Wiley e. Coyote. We're never going to get the chicken. And somehow, that realization pushes us into a corner from which there seems to be no escape. We just can't escape. Maybe you came to worship that morning and that was your sense about your own life. You have been shoved unceremoniously into a certain corner and there is no way out anymore. I know moments like that in my life. I've talked with many others who have faced such realities. I think of a young man named Terry. Terry, not even out of his teens, his life ahead of him. He was chasing it all, everything that life could possibly offer. An education, a degree, a career, more money, a house, a wife, kids. He was chasing it all, and it was all there for his taking until he was shoved into a corner from which he could not escape. A pain in his back that just didn't go away. A visit to the doctor, an experience of which he would later remember only one word. The doctor said many other things, but Terry just remembered one word. The word was leukemia. And it was leukemia that shoved him into a corner from which there was no escape. I've talked with people in that corner. 
I remember her. She was a reasonably young wife. She had much promise in her life, in her marriage as well, until she began to tell the story. It's bad, Pastor. Oh, he's never laid a hand on me, never put his fist on me, but his words, oh, his words. Words like what? She looked down. Words like stupid and idiot and dumb. And then there are worse. It's the things he says. What does he say? Things like, how could you be so stupid? Things like, just like a woman. And then there's worse. Worse? Her husband, her life had backed her into a corner. It was clear in our conversation that she wanted out. She wanted some way to escape. But as soon as that became a topic of conversation, she began the list, all the reasons why she was stuck where she was. No escape from this corner. I've seen people like that. I remember the young couple, bright-eyed, eager, the world at their doorstep. They were going after the American dream, and they were going to get it the American way with a little card about which they could just say, charge it, charge it, charge it. How did the visa bill get so big? It was huge. And that debt shoved them into a corner and said, from here, you will not emerge. Could be that you've come to worship this morning in a corner like that. I don't know what put you there. You were chasing something, maybe something good, maybe something not so good. In the pursuit, you were always and ever convinced, it's just out of reach. I'm just about to grab it. I will finally attain what I want. But then the little boy says, no matter what he does, he's never going to get the chicken. And somehow you have been shoved into a corner and you see no exit. Now the truth is, there are times, there are people in such settings and in such situations who show what they're made of, who show that actually they will find a way. And it's just because of their iron and steel will. You've read of such people, maybe even known such people. I think, for example, of President Harry S. Truman. Many of you will remember the iconic photograph, Truman versus Dewey in the presidential election that year. Chicago Tribune was certain that Dewey was the winner. They were in his camp. And so they had printed the headline, printed the paper before all the votes were tallied. You remember the iconic photograph the next morning with President Harry S. Truman pointing at the headline there in Union Station, St. Louis, Missouri, with a smile on his face. Dewey defeats Truman. Really? Sorry to spoil the celebration. You know. There are people who are made of that kind of stuff. They'll fight to the very end. 2013, Game 6, NBA Finals. San Antonio Spurs versus the Miami Heat. San Antonio Spurs up in the series three games to two. Win this game and they would hoist the championship trophy in celebration. 28 seconds left. San Antonio is up by five. I know a pastor. I know a pastor very well <laughs> who stood in his family room with his son ready to count down those 28 remaining seconds. Miami was in the corner. They would not rise. And then somebody named LeBron James <laughs> hit a three-pointer. A spur missed a free throw. Veteran heat guard Ray Allen hit another three-pointer. 
overtime. And in overtime, Miami won. Three games to three. Game seven, Miami took the series. In fact, if, if, if you want to cause some damage, you know, the human heart is desperately corrupt, all you have to do to a Spurs fan is utter two words. Game six. <laughs> Bring some tissue. <laughs> because there was another piece to the story. You see, with those 28 seconds left to tick off the clock, NBA officials had moved down onto the main floor, and they had cordoned off the area. They were bringing the O'Brien Trophy to award it to the Spurs. Heat are in the corner. It's done. It's over. Sorry to spoil the celebration. Some people have it in them. And yet some situations are so bleak and so dark and so final that when you've been sent to that corner, there truly is no exit. We witnessed one such moment last night. We gathered here in this sanctuary and had a memorial service for Jesus of Nazareth. We reviewed his life, spoke of his good deeds, spoke of the crushing defeat Golgotha heaped upon him and upon all of his followers. We experienced the darkness of that fateful Friday, and we recognized that there are some corners, no matter what we might be made of, from which there is no exit. The foes of Jesus, those who have hounded his footsteps, are prepared. They're about ready to celebrate. This has been a very thoughtful, a very reasoned, and yet at the same time, a very passionate opposition. They have hounded his footsteps. They have tried to trick him with subtlety. They have pushed him into corners from which he's been able to walk away. But finally now, this weekend, success. They arrested him. They put him through a trial, if you want to call it that. They secured convictions, two of them, a political conviction, a religious conviction. They secured the object of execution on the cross. They watched as he staggered and stumbled trying to carry the weight of that beam to the place called Calvary. They witnessed through the events of nature his death on the cross. They beheld as his followers took his body down. They were aware of where they laid him in the tomb one step after another deeper into that dark corner from which there is no exit. And now they're ready to celebrate. They have conquered. Except that. Except that. They really need to do one more thing. They don't want the celebration having any unfortunate interruptions. So they have one last task to complete. They make their way on the Sabbath day back to the procurator's palace. Pilate, the governor of Judea, they have had time with him just the day before. They have discovered that Pilate is a man with a wishbone rather than a backbone. They have watched him as he has tried to forge a compromise which will save this Nazarene from death, unsuccessfully so. They've come back. They have another request. They have pounded one nail after another into this coffin. There is one more nail to drive home. Listen once again to the familiar words from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, beginning in verse 62. The next day, the one after preparation day, 
the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a garden, Pilate answered. Go. Make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Just one more thing, Pilate. One more nail in this coffin. We need to make certain nothing happens to the body. And so Pilate, no doubt frustrated and irritated with these religious types, gives permission. They go to the tomb, and there it is, that large stone, that heavy stone, and it is to that stone that they affix the seal, the seal of Rome, that Roman empire that has kept the peace, the Pax Romana, through the crush of its heavy boot, sealed. And now they call the soldiers. The soldiers whose pounding footsteps have pounded all over the then known world, securing it for the empire, the might of the world, they now stand guard. At last, it's done. He has been sent to a corner from which there is no exit. They are ready for the celebration. It was the historian, the writer, the philosopher, Arnold Toynbee, who said it. Find the body of that Jew, and Christianity crumbles into ruins. Find the body. Christianity is done. Well, that is precisely what the women were intent on doing. In the early morning darkness, the pre-dawn hours clinging to each other with their spices and ointments, they hustle in a small cadre together down the pathway, bodies still racked by sobs, cheeks still streaked with tears. They go in search of the body. The men will follow soon thereafter. Toynbee, find the body of that Jew, and Christianity crumbles into ruins. That is what the women seek. That is what later the men will seek. Somewhere off in the distance, the corks are popping. The champagne is flowing. The celebration has begun because the body of that Jew is in that tomb way back in the darkest corner.